everybody. This is Miss Summers with your notes for today, January 31st, 2018. Uh, characteristics of life is what we're looking at. This is for my biology class. If you have stumbled across it and you need to know this, good for you. Yay! So throughout this uh, lecture, I guess, we are going to go over what makes something living versus non-living and all those requirements. So let's begin with some terms. Uh, if you're in my class, you're following along on your note outline. Terms to know, biotic factors and abiotic. As we go through the year, we'll talk about how life is affected by both of these things. So you know that bio means life. So a biotic factor is something that is alive or living. An abiotic, you may already know that A means without. So abiotic literally means without life. These are things that are not living. So a biotic factor in an environment could be the types of plants and animals you have. And an abiotic factor may be things like temperature and water and things like that. All right. So let's look at the characteristics of what makes something alive, so on the biotic side. And there's eight things, all right? So one of the fundamentals, one of the, the first things we'll talk about is that living things are made of cells. And a cell is simply the smallest unit of life. If you are smaller than that, or you are not made of a whole cell, you're not considered living. And we have two types of cells, prokaryotes, which are much smaller and very simple, and eukaryotes, which are larger. These are the types of cells that we're made of. Now, as you can see, they're much more complex. And we'll talk about that as we go into our next unit, or excuse me, not our next unit, but the unit after that, we'll talk more about these types of cells. But all living things have cells. Our second characteristic is that all living things are able to reproduce. They make more of themselves. And we have, just like we had two types of cells, there's two ways, there's two different ways of reproducing. You can reproduce asexually, so again that A is without, where you only have one parent. So this is things like, uh, things like bacteria would do this, where they just split in half and everybody looks the same. Or you can reproduce sexually where you have two parents or two sources of DNA and your offspring look like a combination of those two parents. And again, when we talk about genetics, we'll talk about why sexual reproduction is a thing. Why is it useful? Why is it helpful in the world of biology? So all living things are made of cells and all living things reproduce. Our third component, or our third characteristic, all living things have a universal genetic code, all right? This is pretty trippy. All living things have DNA and RNA. DNA, again, we have a whole unit on DNA. It's basically our instruction set. But that banana or that apple that you ate for breakfast has the exact same kind of DNA. That's just crazy. It's just in a different order. So all living things will have DNA. Right. All living things will obtain and use material and energy. So there's two components to this. All living things require nutrition, so they have to eat something in some form or fashion, either make their own food or eat something else and then they use that food to make energy. Now yesterday, if you were here yesterday, you saw this in action with our yeast. And hopefully, um, again, I haven't been here this morning, hopefully you'll see that the balloons in our little yeast experiment have filled up with carbon dioxide. Remember yesterday in that lab, we gave those yeast yeasty yeast, we gave them food in the form of sugar, and then the yeast took that sugar and made it into energy, and that process makes carbon dioxide. So hopefully that, that was successful. So all living things 
require food, and turn it into energy. Okay. Our next, our next characteristic of life is that living things respond to the environment. So I have a little video for us to watch after you write this down. All right. Whenever you have a response, you'll have a stimuli that is so that is accompanying accompanies it. Wow, that's a word. All right. So a stimuli is something in the external environment. So that's something outside of you. And you are able to pick it up. Either you hear it or you see it or you smell it or you taste it or whatever. The response is whatever you do because of it. So here's a video with rats and stimulus. Let me see if I can get this bad boy up. Here we go. Habituation. So I want you to look for what is the stimulus and the response. We're going to play that. So, the stimulus in that example would, have, would be that loud noise, that banging noise, all right? The rat's response is that jumping, that startle response where it jumps, it stops, it looks around, and it sees what's going on, all right? The reason that response is helpful to the rat is because that stimuli that it detected could have been danger. So that's why that rat does that. Now you have a question on your sheet. Why do you think it stopped doing that? Well, that rat was exposed to that noise so many times and nothing ever happened. So that rat learned, so that's an example of a learned behavior, that that noise doesn't mean anything. I don't have to pay attention to it. And we'll talk about that when we get to adaptations. Yay! Our next characteristic grows and develops. Um, y'all are teenagers, y'all know this. As you grow, you get larger, you were not the same size that you were in fifth grade and develop, you change in form. So a child, as you all mature in age, you go through puberty and you develop into a young adult. Um, another example in, an an in the animal kingdom, uh, caterpillars, will grow and develop and change into a butterfly. All right. And, oh, nope. Excuse me. So number seven, all living things maintain homeostasis. So homeo sounds like homo. That means same. That's a stem that you're going to want to be okay with. Homeostasis is the ability for an organism to maintain a stable internal environment. So, the most obvious example that we can see in ourselves is our reaction to temperature, which again is kind of a response to the environment. If we get too cold, the hairs on your arms will stand up. That's trapping warm heat closer to your skin. Uh, you'll begin to shiver. And what all shivering is, is your muscles contracting very quickly. That makes friction and that makes heat. So that way, even though the outside of you has changed, your body temperature stays about where it should be. When it's too hot, if your body temperature gets too high, your body will start to sweat. It will lose water, and that water evaporates. It carries some heat away with it. It cools you down. So again, we always want to be sort of in the same range. We don't want our bodies to be changing really drastically. That can be very dangerous. And our last characteristic is evolution, living things evolve. Now, all evolutionists is changing over time. Now, it's very important to note here, and that's why I have two stars. Individuals do not evolve. You and I cannot evolve. We are, our form is set in stone, all right? Um, that's encoded in our DNA, which was set when sperm met egg, boom, that's what we are. 
but a whole group of organisms can evolve. So here's an example. We'll look at this when we get to the evolution unit. Um, these little guys over here, these are prehistoric horses. These are the ancestors of today's modern horse. Now this little horse did not, over the course of its lifetime, grow up into this. It took millions and millions and millions of years for these changes to happen in this group of organisms, right? So, let's just recall, all living things are made of cells. All living things reproduce. All living things require material and energy, so they have to get food and they respire and they do respiration. All living things respond to the environment, contain a universal genetic code in DNA, grow and develop, maintain homeostasis, and groups of living things will evolve over time. So you have to have all eight of those things in order to be considered living. So let's take a look at some examples, and you can fill this in on your little chart on your note sheet. Is it alive? Well, here's our picture. What is it? It's clearly a fire. Is it alive? Hopefully, you know that this is no. Now, we know fires can grow over time. They can get really big. Case in point, California wildfires. That didn't, that didn't start as big as it was. And then all of a sudden, it got out of control. But it is not made of cells. And it doesn't reproduce, it doesn't have DNA, it doesn't have any of that shenanigans, so it is not alive. This, this is a tree. Are trees alive? Yes, they are. They have all eight, and in, in the reason why it's alive, you can just say it has all eight characteristics. This tree grows, This it was not always this size. It obtains nutrients, so it's obtaining carbon dioxide to make into food by photosynthesis. It reproduces, it responds to its environment. Um, you might be saying, well, how does a tree do that? Well, look outside. In the fall, trees respond to the changing environment by shedding their leaves. They change colors and they get rid of their leaves in preparation for winter. So this tree is indeed alive. A paramecium. So this is a single-celled organism and it belongs to the kingdom protist. It is also alive. It has all eight characteristics. It will use this little contractile vacuole to get rid of excess water that's maintaining homeostasis. Here's where it stores food. There's that nutrition. It will reproduce by just cutting itself in half. That's asexual. So it has all the characteristics. And I believe that, yep, this is our last one. This one's kind of tricky. So, you may or may not recognize this photo. This is called a bacteriophage. It's a virus. So, you can just put virus. Are viruses alive? Now, this is one where some scientists like to argue. Some people could argue. It does have some characteristics of life. Like, for example, it has DNA. Um... Viruses can, in a sense, evolve. That's why you have to get a new flu shot every year, because the flu is constantly changing. So your old vaccine doesn't work anymore. But it doesn't have all of them. Viruses are subcellular. They are not cells themselves. They're smaller than that. Um, and one could argue that they don't actually reproduce. How viruses make more viruses is they'll hijack a cell, like this, this virus is taking over this bacteria. And it will insert its DNA into that cell, and then that cell will build viruses. So viruses are sort of one of those, it's sort of weird, um, but it does not meet the qualifications for being alive. All right, so that's our notes for today. You have a foldable to do for me. The instructions are on the website, and there's also a paper copy if you haven't already picked that up. Um, I will see you all tomorrow, February 1st. Hope you have a super fantastic day. Okay, bye.